Jared is going to come up. Jared is our, uh, well, he's a director of Care and Connection now, but Jared helped me start the church. If you're new around here and don't know, he's been here from the beginning, and he's going to end the church today with his introduction. He's going to just split them right in half, That's right? That's right. Yeah. And in fact, it's good that you're leaving I'm because out. we disagree I'm... about a lot of these things. There is, there is no doubt. <laughs> I heard... Anyway, Seriously. I'll just let you tell him. He yeah. should stay up here on stage. Really, he should, because we're going to talk about one that I feel very passionate about. For those of you in the room who feel that your Apple phone is better than Android, you just go ahead and give me a cheer. And those of you in the house who are with me and Android's better, let me hear you. I, I make fun, but that's a, serious, that's a serious thing because green bubbles evidently bother you people just because Apple just now caught up with everybody else in the world and went to RCS. And if you know what that means, that means you're not on Android, okay? You don't understand. Uh, how about this one? Who, who likes Pepsi better than Coke? Thank, the, thank goodness, because there were some Pepsi people in the first service, and I was like, okay, we know what you're about. Coca-Cola, am I right? Whew, golly. All right. Sweet tea. Well, okay. We can do that fight later, sweet or unsweet, but I'm not ready to go there yet. Um, how, about, how about mountains for vacation or beach? Who's with mountains? Yeah, who's with beach? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We got some good people in here. Uh, let's, let's do a couple more. This is, hey, seriously, this is going to cut the room. The tension's going to be thick. You ready? Who squeezes their toothpaste from the middle? Somebody said that's a sin. I agree. Who rolls it from the end and makes sure you roll it and push it all forward, huh? Yeah, yeah. What about this one? How many of you people put your toilet paper and you hang it so it hangs against the wall rather than hanging out up on top? Who does that? On the back against the wall? Woo. <laughs> it should hang up on top, right? Yeah. I know. Listen, if you are, uh, we'll do one last one. I, I, this is three choices. You ready? And, and guys, by the way, if you were students right now, if we were in the high school, if we were down there, here's what I have you do. If you are with LeBron, go to that corner. If you're with Kobe, go to that corner. If you're with MJ, go down to that corner. Who's, who's with LeBron? Greatest of all time. Thank, thank goodness. Who's with Kobe? Woo! I feel your pain, bro. <laughs> All along. MJ, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously. <laughs> so, so obvious. Listen, if you are a Pepsi, go to the mountains, put your toilet paper against the wall, squeeze the toothpaste from the middle, and you think anybody but MJ is the greatest, you need to leave now. We are not friends. <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> I, do, I do joke about this, but the, today's topic is really about this. Aren't there some issues in our world that just divide everybody? Even if you're good friends, it just divides you. I'm about to talk about some serious ones, and there's no need to vote this morning because I really don't want to start to fight. But just think about the things that you may have argued with people that you really do love. Or these are topics that you know when you go home for Thanksgiving or maybe coming up on Easter. You know we're just not talking about that one because it's going to start the, the thing going with Uncle so-and-so or Brother so-and-so. Him so -and -so. It, you know it. Listen, you start talking about who you're going to vote for come this presidential election. Do you feel the tension with your, the people at work and the people in your family about having that conversation or, or maybe it's about just even something locally. Like what's going on with our tax dollars and where we go? What, they raise the tax here and the city tax is going up. Duh, duh, duh. Maybe, you, maybe you understand and know all about that. Man, it really gets you fired up. Or, or maybe for, for some of you, it's just a larger ideological, philosophical idea. Like you, you start talking about the, the virtue of family to our culture. And it's getting torn apart. It feels like there's no value in family anymore. And other people are like, no, no, this is just what it looks like to live in America today. And then you got that argument. And then there's an argument about sexuality and gender. And we don't know, you know, wh where do I stand on that? And where, I stand on that? where does he stand on that? And man, there's just a lot of division right now. And before, listen, before you start having all the arguments in your head about why you have really good reasons to, to, to have convictions you have and the beliefs you have and the standards you have, and before you start having all the pain of the arguments, that have caused some wreckage in your relationships over the past few months or the past few years, before you get into that, can we, just, can we just pause for a second and just point to the fact that something is going on in the midst of all that? And I think it's fear. We're going to talk more about this, but there's a fear at the center of this, and fear causes us often to, to cause these disagreements and conflicts to blow up. And I think 
We've been talking about this series, Losing Connection. I think this is a really key part of talking about how do we continue to make great connections and great relationships and great friendships is to talk about this fear. So we've been in this series. If you haven't been here, I'm going to catch you up. If, if you have been here, that's okay. We're going to do a review. But remember, we've been talking about on the premise that Americans right now are just experiencing historically high f- levels of feeling isolated, invisible, or insignificant. Like those are the three big things we've been talking about. Like to be isolated and visible and insignificant in this world right now, a lot of people are feeling it. We looked at some research that kind of helped us know we were there. Some of the research we pulled out was that adults spend 20% more time alone than they did 50 years ago. Uh, that the youngest generations right now spend 70% less time with their friends than, than we did as young people. I'm no longer a young person, so I, like that... I spent 70% more time with my friends than those of you who are teenagers and 20-somethings than you do. Right? That's, that's a little concerning or at least, at least something to think about. And then uh, 39% of Americans say they feel very connected. That means, that means nearly 61% don't feel very connected to somebody. Like those are all concerning stats and the concerning research. And we kind of landed on this one idea for the series is that without meaningful connection, life ends up in chaos. And the way do we find that chaos is that When we feel isolated or we feel invisible or we feel insignificant, we tend to make decisions about our life, maybe about our work or our finances or or maybe about our marriage or maybe about how we treat our kids or maybe how we treat our parents. And all of that tends to happen. We feel isolated. We'll make different decisions than if we have friends or good relationships around us or healthy relationships. And if we feel isolated, we tend to make different decisions. And if we feel insignificant, then we feel like there's really no purpose that's driving me and there's nothing bigger than me. And so I don't try anything new or I don't take on an opportunity that God may be, have built me for because I just feel like it's insig- I'm insignificant. So all of this thing can cause chaos and God created order for us through community. That's been the whole point of this whole series. And today's topic is just help us deal with this last little piece I think is important for us, especially in our American culture, to think about is, is there a fear that's driving you to cancel some people in your life or to just maybe just move away from or or maybe just distance yourself from some people because you disagree or because they hold some viewpoints that seem a little bit odd or or maybe because they, they have a conviction that is exactly opposite of your conviction. And it's not that, listen, it's not that we all hope that one day we'll all agree. And listen, if you think that's a possible future for us, then you're not thinking about what it is that Jesus came to do. Jesus did not come to make sure that we all thought exactly the same about every issue. His goal was to unify us. So here's here's what I want to do. I want to do a quick disclaimer, and then I want to really challenge us in the room to consider this idea of fear and how it prevents us from having great relationships and unity. First of all, disclaimer on this. Listen, if you are in an abusive relationship, you should never stay close to abusive people. This is not today for you. Listen, if if you are in an abusive situation, you need to find some good friends. Or if you don't have good friends, you need to call for help and get out. Create some healthy boundaries from somebody who is abusing you and putting you in situations where you are harmed. That's not what we're talking about here today. What I am talking about is, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better in our world if fear wasn't at the center of how we thought about the people we disagreed with? Like, what if it were possible to have great relationships, great friendships with people, enough so that you could disagree about issues, but you knew they'd stand with you if things got tough? What if you could have arguments about politics, but have no argument about who was going to be there at 2 a.m. to help you if something went down? What if you knew that you could go to a family dinner and have differing viewpoints at the table, But nobody got up and said, well, that's it. I'm done. I'm never coming back. And you just stayed in the midst of that uncomfortable disagreement and conflict. What if we didn't let fear drive us away? Because I just just want to put this on the list. Listen, for all of us in the room, nothing promotes personal growth (laughs) like a challenging contradiction from somebody who loves you. Am I right? Like, have you thought about that? I would be... A lot, listen, I know I'm still selfish, but I would be a lot more selfish if it weren't for my wife, who for 25 years has helped me understand what it's like to not just pay attention to my needs. And I wouldn't have experienced that personal growth if she hadn't challenged me friendly and lovingly with this challenge of contradiction of like, no, that's not the way you do that. 
Oh, that's not loving? No, that's not loving. Because I didn't see it. And listen, there's things in your life, did you know that there are friends in your life who can see things that you need to grow in? And, and if the relationship isn't strong enough and, the unit, and, and this relationship, this strength and friendship isn't strong enough, did you know that they may come to you and say, man, did you know you're a little bit of a jerk at work yesterday? And you may be like, what? Are you now my enemy? And you will blow a relationship up, not because they're not a good friend, but because they're trying to help you grow. Nothing promotes personal growth like a contradiction from a friend. So if we only spend time reading, listening to, and talking to people who already think like us, we will never be better people in the future. You're as good as you're going to get. And here's what I'm concerned about our American culture right now. We all want to fight for, it seems, a place where nobody disagrees. And everybody thinks like me. And everybody's going to live like me. Because if I could have a community where everybody thought like me and lived like me, then we wouldn't have any arguments or disagreements, and then we wouldn't have any problems in this world, and it would be total peace. I'm here to tell you that's a false narrative. In America, what if we could just change the narrative to figure out how to live with the people who were very different from us? So I just want to be honest with you this morning real quickly. When I think about this fear, my fear of this is driven by two different sides of me. Okay, One is driven by my insecurity. So when I have an argument with somebody, even if they're a close friend, I have a deep insecurity that I'm not going to be able to defend my convictions well enough. So I don't want to get in the argument because they're going to prove I'm wrong or they're going to give me some answer that I can't fight against. And I'm going to be forced to say, well, you're right. And I don't want to be wrong. So better for me to have a bunch of friends who won't tell me I'm ever wrong. So stay away from the people who will ever challenge you to be something different than you are. That's, that's, that's the way I, on one side, that's the way I feel. And then on the other side, I'll just be honest with you. I have a lot of pride. I really, I actually know things that you guys don't know. And if you were my friend and I told you, you should listen to me because I actually know better. And I actually know a better way to live and you, you should really do it like I do it because I, listen, I understand this and this and this, but I know what you don't know. And pride I don't want to get in that relationship either because then I have to then tell them what they're doing wrong and then they get mad at me and it's like, I'm just already right. So I don't know if it lands for you anywhere, but I know for me, listen, I'm afraid to be in those kinds of close relationships because I don't want that kind of tension in my life. I don't want to feel insecure and I don't want people thinking that I'm oh, well, you're just a know-it-all, but I, I kind of am sometimes. That's just the honest truth. I know that's ugly stuff to think about, but I've had to wrestle with the fact that those two things often keep in me from having the best kinds of relationships. And here's, here's kind of how I've thought through it. There's actually three different categories when I argue with somebody. It's helped me to break this down into three different categories. There's three categories of belief. And one of them, we, we often argue with facts, which, by the way, there are real facts in this world. There are real truth. There are things that we can count on. This is, no matter what I believe about it, this is true. There are truths and facts, right? The problem comes... In the set of king category, when I start to argue my opinions as if they're facts, because we all have an opinion about how to interpret those facts. I see that fact, and now that's an opinion. I now think you should do this with that fact. No, I think we should do this with that. No, 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 no. And when we start confusing our opinions with facts, we get in trouble. And this last one really gets me. What if you start taking your feelings, the strongest feelings you have about an issue, and that becomes the basis on which you argue? Right? Well, I feel more strongly about this issue than you. And then it becomes an argument about how loud somebody can yell, right? So it's helpful for me to break it down and just think about the fact that sometimes we're in a disagreement. We're fighting for our own pride. We're fighting for our, from a place of insecurity. And we don't even talk about the facts. We just talk about our opinions and our feelings. And we're beating each other up with no real sense of where is this going? Who, does it matter at the end how right you were? When's the last argument you had with somebody, a good friend, a, a family member, a spouse, where you came out of that argument and you thought, well, at least I won. It doesn't feel good. I've had, listen, I can count on my hand the number of times I've been right in my marriage. Probably, probably more like that. And I can tell you there's two times specifically, and I'm too embarrassed to tell you the stories, where I won the argument. And I lost all my, my wife's respect and trust. And I promised myself after the second time I'd never do it again. 
And I'm not saying I won't, but I'm saying I've been really careful to make sure that when I'm arguing, I know where I'm arguing from, pride or insecurity, and I know what it is I'm arguing about so that I don't put her in a position to distrust or disrespect me because of something I said. So here's what I want to show you. I said, if you're not a Jesus follower here this morning, I think this is super helpful for you. Now, you may not necessarily agree with some of the statements I'm going to make about Jesus and what he adds to this conversation, but I want to tell you that I think the answer for us in terms of these kinds of relationships and the kinds of relationships that will hold us together (laughs) is found in this, okay? So here's what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. Let's go back to that other part. Paul was writing to the Colossians, and it was a church full of diverse people. There were Gentiles and there were Jews. There were the Greeks and the Romans educated with their philosophy and their great philosophers and their great thinkers and their great poets. And then you had the Jewish people educated through their scriptures that they had. They're poets and they're wise people. And you had arguments all the time between these two educated groups, the Gentiles and Jews. And in fact, in the church that Paul was writing to, there was an argument about whether or not all the Gentiles should be circumcised like the Jews because now that they were following Jesus, shouldn't they be circumcised? And Gentiles are going like, no, we shouldn't. And there was this huge argument, huge argument about who was right and who was better educated and whose, whose side was going to win out. And then in the midst of all that, you got these barbarians and these Scythians who have no manners, They don't know, they don't even, they're not educated. They're just these tribes that are kind of balanced around. But somehow they've come to believe in Jesus and Jesus is a part of what they do. And Jesus Jesus has drawn them all together in this one little place. They got all these people who disagree about almost everything. And even the slave owners and the slaves sit together in church on Sunday. And Paul says, no, 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 you don't understand. All of that's fine. That diversity, Jesus loves and shows love to everybody, and it's going to draw a lot of different kinds of people together. But in the end, Christ is all, and he's in all. In other words, here's the great trump card. Ready? Throw down the trump card. Jesus arrives. And when Jesus is in the midst, Jesus is all that matters. And Jesus is in each person. Yeah, but I'm so much more educated, and I know so many more things than the. I mean, come on, seriously, this guy? Right. And so you can set aside your pride because it's not your education that puts you on standing with Jesus. It's Jesus who puts you on standing with Jesus. It wasn't how smart you are. Yeah, I'm just, I just don't know if I fit in here and these people seem so educated and smart and all this kind of, no, 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 no. Because you haven't been educated, it doesn't make you less than. It, I, Jesus has brought you into this unity and this community so that he brought you here. And it's not about whether not educated you are. So there's no reason to be insecure or prideful. We just stand in front of Jesus and now everything else becomes less than him. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's just not the most important thing anymore. In fact, here's the kind of like the bottom line for what Paul says. Different is just healthier when Jesus is at the center. Like when Jesus stands in the center of us, he becomes the reason we're together, not these other things. And so, yeah, there's going to be arguments and disagreements, and we're going to do things different ways, and we're going to have all these different ideas. Of course we are. God created it different ways. We have different experiences. We had different parents. We have different family traditions and customs. And, man, you guys know, if those of you gotten married, you come together and you put these two families together at Christmas, and it just doesn't work sometimes, right? But if Jesus is at the center, and he's what's all in all, then we let some of those other things be less important. So here's how he says to do this. Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, he says, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. Like, you want to get this right? You want to get this really going good in your community? Just make sure you're using compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience when you argue. Because he saw it coming. I think Paul looked at the church in Colossians and was like, yeah, that's a lot of problems. I can't come in there and be like, well, you're right and you're wrong. Hey, there's, no way, there's no way to do that. Here's what I'm going to do. You guys just approach every single disagreement and conflict with this. And I love how he uses this metaphor of clothe yourselves. You put it on. It's not natural, is it, to come into an argument with compassion. You don't immediately come to an argument with, well, I wonder where they're standing on this issue. No. We usually come in guns blazing. I've got the right answer. You need to shut up now. You're wrong. (laughs) We don't deal with kindness. We don't deal with gentleness. We don't try to lead them on. Hey, 
I know we've talked about this before, but I'm still having trouble understanding where you're coming from. Can we go over it again? Because I want to try and understand. We don't do that, do we? We definitely don't do it with patience. I need you to get on board today. Right? Today, today, if you're not on board, I'm done with you. I'm, you're, you're, you're out. You're, you're gone. I just don't understand. I've come to my end. And here's what Paul says in this next verse that we as Christians have to pay attention to. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. And forgive as the Lord forgave you. Don't forgive because you think they deserve it. And don't forgive because you're just being so magnanimous and so generous. No, you're forgiving because we all, listen, we all need forgiveness. Have you said something this past week that you wish you could take back? Yep. Oh, good. Some other people raised their hand. Yeah. We all need forgiveness. So in light of that, those of us who are followers of Jesus, listen to me. If you feel the forgiveness and know the forgiveness that Jesus has given you, how can you not offer that to somebody else who has not been patient with you in an argument? Who maybe came to an argument with less humility than they should have. Can you forgive them if you have a grievance about them? Or on the flip side, can you just go and ask forgiveness if you need it? Here's the last thing Paul says to do. He says, and over all of these, all of all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Do you want unity in your relationships? Then love is the final card you play. If I can't come to terms and I can't agree on anything, will I still love the person across from me? Which means this. The relationship you have with the other person is not defined by how much you agree. It's by how well you treat them through and after the disagreement. My wife and I disagree about a lot. My good friend Matt, who was just up here, he's an apple guy. And he, he likes skiing in the mountains. And I I'll be honest with you, there's some other things that are more serious than that that we disagree about. But at the end of the day, if he needs me, I don't care about his Apple device. I'll still send him a text and I'll be there. Right? So wouldn't it be great if we could develop those kinds of relationships that could stand through a conflict and disagreement? Some of you have lost people or maybe some people have cut you off because of that. I'm hoping we can learn to do this better. Let me give you some quick three things. Listen, even if you're not a believer in Jesus, these three things will help you have better conflict with people you love. You ready? I want you to, to, when you get into an argument, I want you to be clear. Just be clear. Stop and go, what's most important right now? In this moment, in this argument, what, just be clear about it. What's most important? Number two, I want you to be curious. You ask more questions then you give answers. Hey, hey, stop right there. Hold on. You said this. Hey, tell me what you mean by that. Hey, I'm curious. If you think that, are you saying this? Because I'm not sure. Or, or is this what you mean by that? Hey, tell me more about that because I'm, you be curious in that moment. And the last thing you do is you be cautious. Don't be cautious about who you're friends with. Be cautious instead about how right you think you are about the issues you're arguing about. Could you just be clear? Could you, could you be curious and be cautious? Because here's what I think. I think if we were those three things, the different is healthier, would be so much better. Because Jesus would be at the center of that. For those of us who are Christians, Jesus would be at the center. Listen, if you're not sure you're a follower of Jesus, believe in Jesus, and that's fine. Listen, the be clear, be cautious, all that, be curious, all that can be helpful. But here's why we think this is so important. Because when we put Jesus at the center of our community... It's no longer about me getting what I want or me and this person who I agree with, us getting our way. It's about all the other people we disagree with. It's about me serving and giving and sacrificing, maybe sacrificing my opinion, maybe sacrificing my stance a little bit in order to love them well when they're hurting. I had somebody in between services, you know, this is hard because I have a friend who I know is doing something wrong. And I've told her before, and we have arguments before. And I still want a relationship with her. 
How do I go, even though I know she keeps doing this thing that's wrong over and over and over again, how do I keep going and loving her well? And I was like, I don't know how you do it, but I know you just show up. You show up for that person even though you disagree. That's what love does. Jesus followers, you ready for this? If you really believe Jesus was God, the Son of God, he came in God form, that means he was the smartest person that ever lived, and he was the most perfect person that ever lived. And he still let you in. Can you imagine being perfect and right all the time? I know some of you in the room are like, but I am. I get it. But can you imagine being perfect and right all the time? And still trying to be friends with imperfect people all the time? How much, how much frustration would that be? To be around imperfect people all the time who never get it right, who keep doing wrong things over and over, who keep thinking wrong things and you keep, keep going, but I'm still going to love you. I don't know exactly how that looks in your life, but can I just challenge you to do it this week? Can I challenge you to just not cut somebody off just because you disagree? Can I challenge you to hold on to the friends who challenge you and hold them close and be there for them because they may help you grow through something that you don't see coming yet? That's the difference it makes. And I think when somebody who's not yet a follower of Jesus comes here, they may not agree with what we talk about and they may not agree with what Jesus is, but they're going to look here and go, well, I want to be loved like that by people like that. And that's what I hope we're all fighting for. Let me pray for us. God, thank you this morning. God, that you've given us forgiveness. And God, if there's anybody in the room here that needs to go and ask for forgiveness for something they've said or done in the last few years or, or years ago, or, or just in this moment, if they feel like now I, I just need to go and ask for forgiveness, would you give them the courage to go ask for forgiveness of that person they hurt? And for those of who are carrying grudges, God, could you help them just continuously lay down that grudge in light of your forgiveness of them? Could you help them forgive the person who hurt them in an argument or, or disagreement or conflict? And God, I pray for the relationships in this room that you would tighten them together despite the disagreements, despite the different points of view and the different perspectives. Would you give us a healthy idea of community that's based on your love? And God, if we can find unity in that, would you then give us the power to live that out in our communities so that other people can experience that same sort of love in their life? And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.